you know, and I still have objects that were permanently stained as a result of that. But it was living with that knowledge that somebody had done this intentionally yeah. for the rest of that year. I was hypervigilant, to say the least. I can well imagine that you were, and uh, these are two incidents that you recall, mm -hmm. uh, recall with great clarity, mm -hmm. as we've just witnessed. Oh, yes. are, are, is it possible, is it possible, uh, Margaret, to experience a trauma and act out of that trauma and yet have no conscious recollection Absolutely. of the trauma? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'll, uh, a lot, oftentimes that happens. Mm -hmm. no, a lot of times it's that much more difficult for a, a person to even feel equipped to be able to, to go to get help because they don't know what they're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I would think that especially as you, in your work, and I do know that you work with all ages. I mean, Margaret works with adults, but you work with a lot of children too in the foster care, care system uh, and children that have been adopted from foreign countries. And these children come very young to you at two years old even and right. three years old, you know, and they experienced this when they were not verbal. Trauma still exists even if we can't articulate it. Right, right. It has to do with the, the physiology of the brain. We, s we still have a brain even when we're babies, even before the two sides of the brain become connected by the corpus callosum that develops through, actually through a little baby doing the cross-crawl pattern, stimulates the corpus callosum to develop. Really. Yeah, oh, it's, it's really interesting, it really is. But before that, we still have a brain, mm -hmm. obviously. It's just not able to work together in a coordinated way, which is why when a little baby reaches for a rattle or a cookie or something like that, a lot of times it's a very uncoordinated a attempt to grasp the object. Since the two sides aren't working together very well, that Im experience, that emotional, emotionally painful experience they went through doesn't become verbally coded mm -hmm. because they're on two different sides of the brain and so the person still has that real visceral emotional memory but without any verbal coding by which to be able to communicate it to anybody else in their life or even to make sense of it themselves. Yeah, you know, we, we talked um, about the fact that there is a, a response that happens when trauma occurs, and Father, you alluded to some of it in, in your own telling of your own story. We've got a graphic that goes through this. It's called the Instinctual uh, Trauma Response, and, and it's accompanying bodily sensations, and you're talking about some bodily sensations mm -hmm. here as well. So I thought, let's put that graphic up, and let's walk through that graphic and begin to uh, unpack this a little bit for all of those uh, who are watching today. Uh, what is the first stage of that? Our graphic is showing that that first stage is startle. Let's talk about that for a moment. The startle in, a, in any particular trauma, really anything that you can think of would be that I initial moment of, uh-oh, <laughs> something's not right. And sometimes that comes on with a, a suddenness, more like a shock, but sometimes it's, um, it's a rise within the person. Uh, for example, if, if you're in a classroom situation as a child and there's a, a classroom bully in there who always picks on you and the teacher for some reason has to leave the room and the bully starts eyeing you and you start getting that rise within yourself so mm -hmm. it's not always necessarily a, the suddenness of the you know the smoke alarm or that or the alarm bell or that sort of thing but um, but it's that it's that initial experience of, uh-oh, something's not right. Yes, and, and, and that's accompanied by this interior sensation of fear, maybe your heart's beating really rapidly, your palms start to sweat. What is the second stage, as our graphic shows us? The second part is the thwarted intention, and that's a fancy way of saying it's the fight or flight mode when our natural response is to fight or flee because that intention to fight or flee becomes thwarted, then the, the trauma ensues. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes given the situation, a person would tend to fight versus flee, sometimes given um, their size or age or power in the situation or per perceived power or, or that sort of thing, they might tend towards one or another. Mm -hmm. Also, I think character and temperament kind of make up where <laughs> a lot of how you know one person tends towards fighting and one towards fleeing. And the, and the second, the third stage there? The third stage is the freeze, and the freeze is what happens when the person has perceived that their either desire to fight or flee or attempt to fight or flee is, um, isn't effective. Mm -hmm. And the, what happens in the freeze, it's, it's really interesting. It's the person, the freeze for the person registers in the brain 
is a, a different state of existence. The medical term for it is torpor. It registers in the brain as non-existence. And what happens in the body during the freeze is that endogenous opiates are released that can equal up to eight milligrams of morphine. Wow. So in a way it's kind of, I, I always see it as kind of God's pro protection over us. So preparing us to suffer when we yeah. perceive that suffering is coming so that um, <laughs> kind of give us a, a little bit of cushion Relief, from that. If you will. That's right. And then we enter into an altered state of consciousness. That's right, um, and that's just pursuant to that release of endogenous opiates mm -hmm. from within. Everything starts to um, can start to be perceived differently. Usually, it's a change in perception of time, mm -hmm. whereas it feels like time either stands still or speeds up. Um, a change in objects. Sometimes objects don't really feel solid, and everything can start to feel kind of floaty. Or um, sometimes it's a change in perception of people. A mm -hmm. lot of times the the victim will perceive themselves as being very small and powerless and the perpetrator as being very big and powerful. And the last stage of this instinctual trauma response and its accompanying body sensations is self-repair. Um, we skipped automatic obedience. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> Sorry. I did that one for us. <laughs> automatic obedience is kind of the autopilot mode. It's once the freeze has kicked in and the person's kind of having the surreal experience of the event, then they're, um, they've already perceived that their attempt to change the situation isn't going to be effective. And so at this point, they're f following along with what the perpetrator is um, is doing. Oftentimes, it, it's follow it can be following along with um, with a helper mm -hmm. in terms of like if it's medical personnel and they're they're giving me commands to follow and that sort of thing but it's more of the autopilot mode where the person's is has become a follower in the situation yeah and self-repair follows all of this that's right and that's our attempt to restore ourselves to some kind of semblance of order there's so much to discuss about this topic margaret i'm so happy that you're going to be with us for uh, four more programs as we walk our way through trauma and the effects that it has on us and the healing and hope that's available thanks so much for being with us today mm -hmm. and you father are always so happy when you're with me here and on this beautiful set and let's uh, talk today about a great saint who knew well what trauma is all about her name is saint vivian also known as St. Bibiana. She and her sister were orphaned when their parents were martyred during the persecution of Julian the Apostate. Her father had been branded on the face with a hot iron and he died from his wounds a few days later. Her mother was beheaded. The court placed the girls into a home of prostitution, but when Vivian refused to earn her keep in this sinful way, she was put into a madhouse. There she was scourged to death and she died in 361 AD. It is said that her body was thrown to the dogs, but none of the animals would touch her. After about two days, a priest retrieved her body and buried her. A church was built over her grave in the garden of which an herb grew that is said to be useful for headache and epilepsy. St. Vivian is truly a saint for those who have known trauma, and we would ask for her intercession today. And if that is your situation, I would encourage you to pray for her. Well, friends, as you know, we've got all of the resources available for you that we've spoken about in our program today. And we invite you to go out there to our website, www.womenofgrace.com, or to call us at 800-558-5452. Until we are together again, may God richly bless you. Bye-bye now.